بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم سلام علیکم و رحمت الله in the name of God the beneficent the merciful uh, first of all I have to thanks to all of the scientific committee of this nice uh, congress special to my one of my best friends Dr. Susi Chandra and uh, other uh, executive committee of this congress my topic is about interventional pain management for vertebral body compression fractures. Uh, at the first of outline, my outline is this topic is I talk about some about vertebral compression fractures, percutaneous and minimal invasive techniques, and finally new advances for augmentation. Vertebral body fractures is one of the most um, important and major health problem affecting geriatric patient and, and leading to pain, significant morbidity and health care expenses. The painful vertebral fracture can be a significant problems for patients and limiting physical function and also quality of life and finally can increasing social isolation. The most frequent complication of osteoporosis there are four, and the prevalence of the fracture is about 80% in 80 years old women. And in the elderly are associated with morbidity, intolerable side effects due to medical treatment and also increased mortality in this population. The osteoporotic fracture prevalence per year in the US is about 700,000 vertebral compression, compression per year and about uh, 300,000 hip fracture and also about uh, 215,000 uh, wrist fracture. Therefore, the vertebral compression fracture is the top of these fracture in the uh, elderly. Uh, the most symptom in this patient is back pain and the location of the, this pain is most common in the mid thoracic region uh, at uh, T7 to T8, and also the nexus thoracolumbar junction at T12 to L1. As you see in this uh, figure, you see uh, the most location of the fracture is T7 and T8, and also in T12 and L1. Vertebral fractures typically occur at an anterior third of the vertebral body, and this is the vertebral bone is less prominent. Acute and chronic pain and uh, pulmonary dysfunction and the chronic spinal deformity, depression, increased mortality, and uh, cost about uh, $40 billion per year are these uh, side effects and complications of this problem. Uh, and the, the next some uh, side effects and complications of a fracture are neurologic deficit and gait disorder and balance disorder in this patient, loss of mobility, and also increased risk of future fracture in the adjacent uh, vertebral. The final is greater mortality compared to fracture. There are some risk factors in these patients. The first, unfortunately, in the female, especially in the postmenopausal period. The next is cigarette and smoking is one of the most important risk factors for, for inducing fracture. And also family story, drinking and alcohol, street administration, and also immobility and inactivity, there are, is our there are some risk factors to this problem. The natural history of fracture, many of the clinical of these patients will be silent and discover later in the next time, usually healed without any intervention in about 12 weeks. And up to one third have delayed healing. And finally, some of the, these patient compression may progress without any treatment. There are some broad range in this patient from doing nothing and then his physical 
and treatment and exercise and poses, assistive devices. Some patients take medication. Some undergo to imaging and other tests. Some patients receive injections and nerve block and some of the patients receiving minimal invasive procedure. My conservative management with patients, including uh, rest with DVT prophylaxis and also analgesic medication, for example, in Salem, sometimes opioid, and also brace to keep immobility and typical time course about six weeks and follow up X-ray about two week intervals and also assess prog progression. Uh, why conservative management in these patients may not relieve pain and also frequently leads to prolonged immobilization of the patient and also may lead to pulmonary deterioration, persistent pain, progressive chaotic deformity, and also weight loss, depression, and overall compromise in the life quality of this patient, especially in this geriatric and elderly patient. Other than conservative, there are surgical techniques to treating vertebral compression fracture. The first is percutaneous and minimally invasive or known as augmentation, including vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. And the second is a neurosurgical and invasive technique, including spinal fusion. The objective of vertebral body augmentation for the patient suffering from uh, vertebral body compression fracture is or limit muscular damage, and also decrease post-operative pain, and also decrease length of the stay, and now finally accelerate post-operative recovery compared to surgical procedure. One of the most important points to select this patient for performing augmentation and the indication of the, this patient the all of the vertebral compression fractures due to osteoporosis, including senoid, stood and others. The next is cancer, metastatic or primary cancer, and also is multiple myeloma. These patients suffer from several fractures, and any huge hemangioma can cause fracture, uh, vertebral fracture. The inclusion criteria for the patient suffer from vertebral body compression fractures if the pain is localized to a fracture or tumor. And the other inclusion criteria is pain refractory to medical management, and also fracture less than 12 months old. Therefore, the old fractures is not a good candidate for this procedure and at least 50% height loss of the vertebral body and acute or semi-acute on MRI or bone scan. Before performing augmentation, including vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, you have to pay more attention to contraindications for this procedure, including if the vertebral body was healed, known as cold or bone scan on MRI, or if the fracture extending to a posterior vertebral cortex is very, very important because you have to complete intact posterior wall of the vertebral body or preventing of cement leakage into the spinal canal. And if the fracture causes core compression, this is not good candidate because if you inject the cement, you increase the increase the pressure of the vertebral body and cause more core compression and may some spinal injury. If the patient suffer from radiculopathy, it is not good indicate because it's uh, that indicate the nerve root compression. And if the patient suffer from infection, systemic or local infection, and finally is any untreated coagulopathy. In uh, vertebral body augmentation, 
usually we inject the cement into the uh, vertebral body fracture, both in uh, vertebroplasty or in kyphoplasty. The mechanism of the cement is, and pain relief by cement is mechanical stabilization of the fracture and also thermal necrosis and also chemotoxicity of the intraosseous pain receptors. And finally, it's neurotoxicity mediated by the monomer of the cement. One of the most uh, problem and the most important cause progeria of the augmentation and cause some biomechanical changes including in end-plane necrosis because excessive cement induction has some trauma to the end plate and produce necrosis and also leakage into the base spinal canal and the vascular area and also excessive cement injection cause increased stiffness of vertebral body and also increased stress on adjacent vertebra or refracture in these patients. The minimal amazing technique or interventional technique as known as augmentation, there are two more and two important and famous augmentation called as vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty. Percutaneous vertebroplasty introduced in 1994 in France and used in USA in 1993. And the first case series by vertebroplasty in USA was published in 1997. Percutaneous injection of electrolytic bone cement or PMMA to stabilize and treat painful vertebral compression fractures. Therefore, there is two approaches. In transpedicular, therefore you pass the true car through the pedicle of the vertebral body and the extra pedicular, you uh, introduce the true car extra of the pedicle. Usually in the lumbar region, for example, one, two, three, four, five, we usually perform transpedicular approaches, but in the thoracic region, usually we, we perform extra pedicle due to angulation of the pedicle compared to the body. This is the schematic view of the vertebroplasty by transpedicular approaches. You can perform unilateral or bilateral, but we have to pay attention bilateral sometimes may increase the risk of pedicular fracture. In other hand, unilateral may not complete stability, stability in the vertebral fracture. Therefore, the patient have to, uh, to judgment which is better. And therefore we can, in the lumbar region, as you show in this uh, slide, this is transpedicular in the for vertebroplasty. This is the, the right side is the lateral view and the left is uh, AP view. Used by transpedicular approach into the vertebral body. After the introduction of the needle, you inject the cement, usually not high volume to stabilize the vertebral fracture. There are multiple studies have documented more than 50% pain relief in the short term in by following vertebroplasty. But the risk of cement leakage and the vertebral body height restoration, this is two risks because the height of the vertebral body is not restored in the vertebroplasty. We have to pay attention to some contraindication for this procedure, including infection, vertebral, such as vertebral stomalitis, epidural abscess, or other systemic or local infections, such as urinary tract infection. Ensure that the margin of the spinal colon are intact. The leakage in the epidural space may cause venous thrombosis, spinal stenosis, cord or navel compression, and also leakage from the paraspinous veins into the vena cable may result in a pulmonary embolus. 
as I mentioned before, the cement leakage is one of the most important and most complication after the augmentation and leakage can cause in the necrosis leakage into this spinal canal, vascular area, stiffness, and increased stress on adjacent vector or refracture. As you see in these two slides, in the right side in the CT and the left in the radiography of epidural leakage of the cement. And also you can see the, this slide is retrograde leakage of the cement of the vertebroplasty. In the past, some of the physicians performed several uh, vertebroplasty in the body, but multi-level vertebroplasty should be avoided now in the patient with low cardiopulmonary reserve. And that is a strict attention paid to cement volume because high risk for bone marrow embolism or fat embolism. Uh, there are some case reports, pulmonary cement embolism after high volume of cement injection. The next procedure is balloon kyphoplasty. The most different difference between kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty is uh, in the, as I mentioned before, in the vertebroplasty after introduction of the needle into the vertebral body, you inject the cement. But in kyphoplasty, after introduction, the needle into the vertebral body, you can enter some drilling to increase cavity of the, to produce a cavity in the vertebral body, and after that, introduce a, a balloon, an inflation of the balloon can cause uh, an appropriate cavity. And after that, by bone filler, you inject the cement uh, step by step and with low pressure. Therefore, the risk of cement leakage is low and also increase the height of the vertebral body. Therefore, the benefit of analgesia in the vertebral fracture in combination with restoration of the vertebral body height and also you follow the same principles and general exclusion criteria similar to vertebral plastic. The contraindications are absolute, including a symptomatic patient. You have no perform any procedure or a patient improving with non-surgical care. And if the patient history of vertebral body osteomyelitis and allergy to cement or dye, and also irreversible coagula, but if you have there are absolute contraindications for this process. The relative contraindication is radiculopathy and cortical retropulsion against her neural structures, because in this patient, the risk of the cement leakage into the spinal column is high. And uh, if the height of the vertebral body greater than 70%, 70 percent, seven. 70% loss of the height. And if patients suffer from several and pathologic fractures, and if you have a but not side effect, don't form in your center. Other complications is uh, subsequent adjacent fracture about 15 to 20% of time after the augmentation and also extravasation of the cement, improper through her placement and usual complications of bleeding, infection, and nerve damage or some complication. Therefore, as I mentioned before, the two more, two important benefits of the kyphoplasty is analgesia in vertebral fracture and also restoration of the vertebral body height. There are two approaches, transpedicular, usually in lumbar region, and also extrapedicular or parapedicular is uh, selected for thoracic fracture. This is the schematic of transpedicular, therefore you pass the true car through the pedicle into the body. This is a true car and extrapedicular, usually for thoracic, because the angulation of the pedicle is more, therefore you cannot pass the true car through the pedicle into the body. Therefore, you have to perform extra pedicular approaches. Uh, the pedicles of mid-thoracic spine are slender, 
and usually oriented more toward the sagittal plane than lumbar. And transpedicular often is not possible to achieve sufficient conversions of the middle to be the anterior third of the vertebral body. And the third is low angulation of pedicle does not allow a central placement of the balloon. Uh, Transcostal vertebral axis is needle is inserted kind of to transverse process to the groove between the uh, next and also this position results in more medial needle angle and the third is need greater than about seven to ten centimeter lateral to midline. Needle passes above the transverse process and unilateral may be sufficient for smaller vertebral mid thoracic spine. To perform the abuse procedure, you have uh, administered antibiotic and the biplane fluoroscopy is uh, more appropriate and also usually perform augmentation on the local anesthesia. We suggest don't perform this procedure under general anesthesia because, because if you, your true card uh, contact to the nerve root, if the patient is awake, uh, she or he alarmed to you, therefore you reduct your true car. Therefore, the co-local anesthesia or enough local anesthesia by Lydic and Ropibacan is uh, more and more better. At first, you small, small incision after incision, careful uh, tapping by hammer, you introduce the needle and slightly by hammering, you conduct the needle into the transpedicular, into the vertebral body. And those needles for the process to climb on tip or bevel tip stellate must remain. Uh, and also superior to the inferior cortex of the pedicle, the lateral to the medial cortex in oblique view. In the lateral view, advanced needle styled to the anterior one third to one fourth of the body, and anterior vertebral body cortex should not be passed to prevent leakage of the anterior leakage. After the placement of the needle, your drilling allows the needle and the balloon to pass better. After that, you pass the balloon into the needle and inflate the balloon under fluoroscopy, sometimes you perform bilateral, sometimes for two levels. And this is the graphy of the two uh, bilateral kyphoplasty, and you see two balloon before inflation. Before inflation, the right of pack markers, you can you have to see both markers and ball inflation to increase to create a center cavity and return the needle to posterior one third. And finally, ball inflation on the live fluoroscopy is mandatory. Uh, inflation continues slowly, slowly, and until the system reaches maximum pressure or balloon reaches one of the cortical margin or vertebral kyphotic deformity is correct. After that, you uh, deflate the balloon and inject cement slowly by bone filler on the liferoscopy and use no more than two or four milliliters for of the cement per vertebral level. This is for uh, schematic view of the picture of the bone cement injection. And this is a picture of graphy of the cement injection should be performed in the lateral view and deliver cement equal in the body while avoiding. Then precautions of the augmentation. Uh, there are some precautions, for example, full visualization of the bony landmarks from severe osteopenia or tumor destruction. And also in the cervical or in high thoracic of T5 is extremely challenging due to difficulty in visualization, the osseous landmarks and the small size of the target pedicles and vertebral bodies and shoulder are significant barrier in obtaining visualization. Therefore, in the height thoracic, maybe or lower cervical may be more complicated. This is the picture of the bone inflation and ball inflation and this is bilateral. And there are some uh, published papers, for example, 
comparison of the kyphoplasty and vertoplasty provided greater pain relief and fewer subsequent fracture. Kyphoplasty was superior to vertebral in disability improvement and have a lower risk of cement leakage. Or in another published paper, there's no reason should vertebral kyphoplasty can increase fracture of adjacent vertebral bodies. And on, you know, while in the last, I talked a little bit brief about the new advances for augmentation other than kyphal. There are some, several new techniques, for example, the standing vertebroplasty, RF, Skyphoblasty, Jack Span, Spider Kaifo, Shield Kaifo, Kiva. And uh, in a standing via mesh before cement injection to cover, to prevent the uh, cement leakage, as you see in this CT uh, scan. In the RF uh, augmentation, the potential treatment for osteogenesis imperfecta, who have numerous vertebral fractures, and also home conservative treatment has been ineffective. There are some uh, published papers for RF. Uh, augmentation is safe and effective process to KIFO. And others is uh, provide 15% uh, reduction of leakage compared to KIFO. And now there is KIFO velocity, the bone expander devices utilize the plastic polymer tube, which uh, radial expanded. Uh, popcorn like shape within the collapse vertebra to reconstructed vertebral height. There's some uh, published paper. The next is a spider kyphoplasty generating a cavity by a metallic device instead of balloon within the vertebral body. And uh, this is similar to balloon, but this, the, the difference is this is a metallic devices and increase uh, height of the vertebral body. The next is shield capoplasty to prevent bilateral capoplasty, which can unilateral performing by shield capo and in unilateral stable cavity creator and a self expanding stent lock implant designed to direct cement flow for optimal placement. This is the, another schematic of this. The next is spine jack. Uh, this uh, the device can increase the height of the uh, vertebral body, and also after that the cement was injected. The Kiva system is another system. Instead of balloon, the nitinol coil will be guided through the cannula into the vertebral body and acts as a white wire for the plant. And uh, there are some. This is a safe uh, procedure. And finally, the percutaneous semen augmented, the screw fixation. And uh, there are some published paper summary. Percutaneous techniques are relative safe and, in eff and effective methods. Pay attention to inclusion and exclusion criteria. And new advances are under investigation for uh, this procedure. Thank you very much for your attention. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Arnani Mani, for your presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, have, we will have discussion later after the second uh, speaker. You may write it down in the Q&A column. So now let's go to our second speaker. Uh, very yeah. often, following a laminectomy, patient recover without any complications. But sometimes cause a condition where the patient still suffer from persistent pain in the back following the surgery. For the second speaker, we have Dr. Altan Sahin from Turkey that will talk about interventional pain management in post laminectomy syndrome. So Dr. Altan Sahin, please start. Uh, hello, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, my dear, big brother Sustilo for inviting me uh, to this very prestigious uh, Congress held every year. And I will talk about the interventional pain management in post laminectomy pain, and which was uh, uh, before it was called failed back surgery syndrome. I have no conflict of interest and uh, my plan will be, uh, I will talk about first about the general terms 
uh, post-laminectomy syndrome, then the clinical picture, and then I will talk about uh, the management uh, of the post-laminectomy syndrome. So, as I told you, it was previously called failed back surgery syndrome, but our surgeon friends are very uh, are hesitating to use that uh, term because they never fail. And that's why uh, now we call it post-laminectomy syndrome. Well, spine surgery in uh, the recent years uh, is increasing and there has been an upward trend in total number of fusion, especially in fusion cases, uh, in the world, as you can see in this uh, Reisner study, uh, between 1998 and 2008, and then uh, another study, 1998 and 2014, there has been an enormous increase in the uh, incidence of uh, prevalence of uh, spine surgery, spine spinal fusion, and the elective lumbar fusion increased about 62% between years uh, 2000, is, uh, uh, between 2004 and 2015. And uh, when we compare a uh, look for the hospital costs, they increased 177% during these 12 years. And it exceeds $10 billion in only in 2015. And per admission, it costs about 50,000 US dollars. And if we come to the definition of uh, failed back surgery syndrome uh, by the ISP, lumbar spinal pain of unknown origin, either persisting despite surgical uh, intervention or appearing after surgical intervention for spinal pain originally in the same topographical location. Uh, the etiology of uh, failed back surgery syndrome is might be preoperative, which are the patient factors, intraoperative factors, and postoperative factors. Let's talk now about the preoperative factors. Uh, the, one of them is anxiety, depression, or other psychiatric uh, conditions of the patient. Obesity is a factor, and smoking is also factor, uh, presence of litigation of or workers' compensation claims and physical or radiological findings such as stenosis, fibrosis, and disc herniation uh, are uh, preoperative patient factors. And strongest association is the psychosocial factors of the patient and choice of an inappropriate surgical candidate or surgical approach may be a preoperative factor. And the patients who undergo multiple prior back surgeries have higher chance of developing post-laminectomy syndrome and a lower chance of uh, having a successful pain relief with the surgery. The intraoperative risks are operating at the wrong vertebral level. Well, usually the surgeons can uh, miss the lumbarization or sacralization and operate the wrong level. And operating at a single level, while there are several other uh, levels are ill too. An improper technique during surgery is a risk factor, and of course, operative complications like hematoma and infection uh, are the things, the complications that may cause uh, postoperative uh, pain, postlaminectomy pain. And when we look at the postoperative factors, uh, after the uh, surgery, uh, the spinal stenosis might, might increase, uh, spinal instability might come back again. Epidural fibrosis, fibrosis is very important and can be uh, treated uh, with uh, several interventions and disruption of adjacent discs. And of course, recurrence of the disease are uh, postoperative uh, factors. When we look at the epidemiology, uh, chronic low back pain uh, is experienced by the people in 51 to 84% throughout their lifetime. And 
10 to 40 percent of patients having surgery have failed back surgery syndrome and this might uh, go up to 46 percent in lumbar fusion however even in microdiscectomy there's a risk of 20 25 percent of uh, developing post laminectomy syndrome when we look at the pathophysiology uh, lateral uh, stenosis of the foramina may be a cause painful disc de degeneration, disc herniation, neuropathic pain, pseudoarthrosis, as I told, uh, epidural fibrosis, and increased uh, spinal instability due to discectomy or laminectomy, and the redistribution of load to the adjacent disc tissue, which is called adjacent level disease. Well, in history taking, uh, we must know the character and the location of the patient's pain compared to the pre-surgical pain. And uh, if there's a lack of immediate pain relief, we must suspect operation at the wrong level. And if there's a new onset of pain, uh, it might be a surgically induced nerve damage or a hematoma or whatsoever. And if there's a low back pain, uh, the facet joint arthropathy might be one of the causes. Of course, sacroiliac joint issues and myofascial etiology must be thought too in history. The red flags to interact are the uh, one of them is the cow diquina syndrome, uh, is seen with saddle anesthesia and bowel and bladder incontinence. An infection is very important fever, chills, and weight loss. Uh, might be the symptoms of it, and malignancy is another red flag. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> the ph in physical examination, if the patient has spinal stenosis, it's usually exacerbated when you, uh, the patient is extended, spinal extension, and relieved by flexion. So, and this herniation. Uh, a recurrent disc herniation may present with a positive sign of straight leg raise. In diagnosis, we use some tools like x-ray. We can see the vertebral and sacroiliac defects, misalignments, and spondylolisthesis with x-ray. And we can see adjacent segment degeneration uh, in x-ray and loss of lower doses uh, might be uh, observed. In MRI, especially with, the, with contrast media, epidural fibrosis can be uh, shown and also disc herniation, recurrent disc herniation can be uh, shown with MRI. And if uh, the patient has an instrument, there might be an uh, uh, artifact in the MRI. So CT myelogram is a good choice to uh, perform in these patients. Of course, to look for infection, uh, search for infection, sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein uh, is a very useful tool. Of course, there are some interventional diagnostic tools like diagnostic nerve blocks. If the, you are thinking about facet joint arthropathy, uh, dual medial branch blocks two times must be performed uh, might show us that the problem is in the uh, facet joints. If uh, the uh, we perform lateral branch blocks or intraarticular sacro uh, sacroiliac injections, we can have clues about sacroiliac joint pain. If we think of a foraminal stenosis, a transforminal epidural, or a selective single level block might, might be performed to uh, diagnose which level is uh, problematic. And provocative discography uh, is used to evaluate the discogenic pain. And the management might be, first of all, it might be conservative like physical therapy uh, is important, uh, developing tolerance, neuroadaptation, conditioning, and some exercises to strengthen the back muscles 
are uh, are of importance. Medications like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and opioids, anticonvulsants and antidepressants are important, if, especially if the patient has a neuropathic pain, anticonvulsants and antidepressants might be used. But we must be very cautious about using NSAIDs because uh, using uh, in, a, in a very prolonged time, we must follow the uh, renal function tests as uh, it uh, makes spasm in the uh, atrioglomerular arteriole in, uh, in the glomerulus. Cognitive and behavioral therapy is also uh, might be used. And there are also invasive management tools like interventional blocks or radio frequency or whatever, and surgery. The interventional techniques might be medial branch radio frequency ablation, dorsal root ganglion, pulse radio frequency, adhesiolysis, if there is an adhesion uh, shown, epidural steroid injections, sacroiliac uh, blocks and denervation, and of course, neuromodulatory interventions like spinal cord uh, stimulation or uh, programmable intrathecal pumps. Surgery, uh, when we talk about surgery, the patient must be, there must be some obvious, clearly identified pathologies for the reoperation. And the reoperation is usually uh, have less outcome, lower out outcome, and higher morbidity if uh, there is a reoperation. Bowel and bladder impairment, motor weakness or neurological deficit. In case of these uh, symptoms, the immediate surgical uh, intervention is mandatory. The interventional techniques that we use in pain practice might be diagnostic, as I've told, and therapeutical. Diagnostic interventions are medial branch blocks, intraarticular facet joint injections, lateral branch blocks or intraarticular SIG injection and transforaminal epidural and discography. Medial branch blocks are, you know, this is a procedure which an anesthetic is injected to the small nerve, very small nerves called uh, the medial branch uh, nerves. And uh, you see here, uh, the medial branch nerves uh, have one nerve uh, innervates the lower uh, and the uh, equal level uh, facet joints. And intraarticular facet joint injections is uh, I no longer uh, do this, but uh, it might be done. Uh, and you uh, just inject some uh, local anesthetic to the uh, facet joint, inside the facet joint, uh, under fluoroscopy, of course. Lateral branch blocks and intraarticular uh, sacroiliac joint injections are done between the sacroiliac joint and the sacral foramina in S1, S2, and S3, uh, where sacroiliac joint is, uh, uh, is innervated. Transforaminals, as I've told you, epidurals uh, can be done, and this should be uh, done under fluoroscopy again, and we must see the anterior epidural uh, spread and uh, root spread of the contrast media, and then uh, give the local anesthetic or steroid or whatever. Uh, provocative discography mimics the physiologic disc loads and evoke the patient's pain by increasing intradiscal pressure with an injection. Uh, and we can also see uh, the different shapes of the uh, disc, uh, pathological shapes of the disc, like cotton ball and irregular fissures and ruptures, even ruptures too. And so uh, if the patient feels uh, pain, so that might be the problematic uh, disc. Uh, and this can give us some idea. 
Therapeutic in, uh, interventions are medial branch radio frequency, dorsal root ganglion PRF, adhesiolysis, steroid injections, sacroiliac denervation, and neuromodulation. Uh, and medial branch radio frequency ablation targets, uh, there uh, is, uh, we have the targets of uh, refractory low back pain. The target is zygo apophysial joint. And we know that significant pain relief and functional improvement happens after uh, this, these blocks. But usually when we use uh, radio frequency, we have to wait two to three weeks to have the uh, clear effects of radio frequency. So if the patient, uh, the patient is likely to uh, feel pain during the couple of weeks, uh, these couple of weeks. And uh, the study by uh, Bogduk, Bog, Nikolai Bogduk's group uh, revealed that uh, after dual comparative medial branch blocks, 60% of patients had 90% pain relief at 12 months, which is a great uh, result. And 87% experienced at least 60% uh, pain relief. Another study uh, revealed 100% pain relief with dual comparative medial branch blocks and 53 to 58 of patients, percent of patients experience this complete relief up to 15 months after uh, radio frequency ablation of the lumbar medial branches. And uh, with a primary outcome of 50% reduction in this uh, study, uh, the, as you can see, uh, more than 50% uh, reduction uh, was 56% uh, of the patients, 80% reduction, 22%, and 100% reduction was 12.9%. And after 24 months, uh, the of course, this uh, pain relief has decreased down to 44% uh, pain re relief. Radiculopathy or radicular pain after lumbar surgery is uh, reported as an etiology of failed back surgery in, in approximately 10% uh, of the patients. And Pulse radio frequency of the dorsal root ganglion can effectively uh, uh, manage uh, the lumbar sacral radiculopathic pain in patients. So this is a study uh, uh, with electrophysiologically uh, shown radiculopathy, uh, neuropathy, or uh, no normal uh, subjects have been uh, performed uh, dorsal root ganglion uh, pulse radio frequency in this uh, study. And you see uh, there is a, a considerable decrease in uh, the pain scores, uh, numeric rating scale, and Oswestry disability index uh, in, on, in all three groups of patients. And this is a prospective non-randomized study. Uh, well, uh, they studied 57, 56 patients. Either one group had transforaminal epidural steroid. Uh, another group uh, additionally had a DRG uh, pulse radio frequency. And uh, well, in all uh, groups, both groups, uh, there have been a considerable uh, significant uh, pain relief after the treatment. And uh, when we look at the sciatica bothersomeness index, uh, the PRF group, uh, pulse radio frequency group, had a better, had better results. Uh, this study uh, shows that uh, early clinical count outcome after revision operation or radio frequency treatment and uh, uh, they studied 70 patients. This is a very recent study. And the uh, results are quite similar in these 
patients were into uh, back pain, leg pain, uh, Oswestry score, and short form 36 score. And the, of course, the revision operation had uh, a lot of complications like infection and additional surgeries and uh, neurologic deficits was the same in all groups. And epidural injections might be done with steroids or high to, uh, uh to treat the uh, epidural fibrosis. This study uh, shows that 60 patients with documented fibrosis in fewer than three nerve roots, and uh, they gave hyaluronidase uh, to one group, uh, methylprednisolone to the other, and both to the other group. And uh, the analgesia at one month was okay, but the effects reduced three to six months follow-ups, and there was no stat statistical differences between the three groups. And this is uh, the study by Manchikanti. It's a randomized control study. Interesting one group uh, received uh, lidocaine, the other lidocaine plus uh, a steroid. And uh, the primary outcome was 50% improvement. And uh, uh, you see the, the, uh, either the numeric rating scores and Oswestry disability index were similar in both groups. So they conclude that caudal epidural injections uh, uh, work in lower extremity pain in patients with post-lumbar surgery syndrome. Sacroiliac denervation is another uh, issue. As we know, as adjacent uh, segment disease is important. If the uh, patient is uh, stabilized, fusion surgery is done, uh, in the lumbar area, sacroiliac pain is reported up to 43%, and imaging shows 75% of sacroiliac degeneration. And if uh, spinal fixation is done to the sacroiliac joint, so the next uh, joint is the hip, so hip osteoarthrosis increases. So how do we uh, denervate the sacroiliac joint uh, with conventional radio frequency, bipolar radio frequency, simplicity, multipolar probe, cooled uh, radio frequency, or endoscopic uh, ra uh, radio frequency. This is the conventional uh, radio frequency uh, lesioning, just uh, one monopolar uh, electrode. We uh, perform it. And this is bipolar. So uh, with bipolar radio frequency ablation, we increase the lesion uh, size. And so uh, it is more, uh, it is better than uh, the monopolar. This is the multipolar probe, uh, Simplicity 3, uh, which uh, makes uh, two bipolar uh, lesions and three Mon monopolar uh, lesions, and it is uh, placed between sacroiliac joint and sac uh, sacral foramina. And <clears throat> this is a very uh, effective and very good uh, thing. And an S1 facet joint must be added to this, uh, to this uh, procedure. And this is cooled radio frequency. Uh, this is another uh, technique. And uh, there are uh, three points in uh, first and second sacral foramina and two points at the third sacral foramina. And these are, uh, this is a quite a long uh, procedure, but it is very effective. And this is this endoscopic sacroiliac joint uh, denervation introduced by So Choi. And this, uh, you can uh, do this denervation under uh, visualization here. So this study uh, had 121 patients and uh, they, uh, uh, they reviewed uh, two different ablation techniques, monopolar and uh, simplicity. And you see uh, mo uh, multipolar uh, simplicity has better outcomes uh, in both 
pain scores and quality of life scores. And this uh, study shows cool radio frequency is a safe and effective method in patients uh, with sacroiliac problems. And this uh, study just uh, recently uh, published as 23 patients and 79 uh, for, for endoscopic radio frequency treatment and 79% of the uh, patients had good outcome and uh, long outcome. Epidural adhesiolysis is, can be done with RAX procedure or epidroscopically. And this uh, is about the percutaneous adhesiolysis, the RAX procedure, and it, is, uh, it might be used after conservative management is done. And this is another uh, study that says that RAX procedure is a well-tolerated, safe, and effective treatment. And this one is endoscopic adhesiolysis and percutaneous adhesiolysis are compared and uh, they uh, conclude that uh, percutaneous adhesiolysis has level one and uh, epidur epiduroscopy has level two to three uh, evidence level and both might be used for low back and lower extremity pain. And this is a very recent study by Gedoke, and they showed a uh, significant re reduction in uh, pain scores and OSBEST3 disability index. And uh, there are uh, these uh, studies that uh, show that there is reduced need for spinal cord stimulation when we perform epidural epidroscopic leases of adhesions under, uh, under vision, and the total cost is uh, least, uh, less more than 10 times. And uh, this is another study that shows that. And spinal cord stimulations is the final uh, thing to do in these patients. And how it works, it uh, decreases sending nociception, increases descending inhibition, and uh, modulates the pain perception. And this study by Richard North, who is a surgeon, that uh, it is better to have spinal cord stimulation rather than re-operating the patients. And this is another uh, comparison with conventional medical management and spinal cord stimulation. So spinal cord stimulation is better than that. Uh, there are different kinds of uh, spinal uh, cord stimulations, high frequency and low frequency traditional and burst suppression. And they are both, they are all uh, good. And high frequency uh, stimulation is uh, studied in a sensor RCT. And we see the back pain is better uh, controlled in, uh, in, uh, in this high frequency. Uh, treatment. And this is the 24 months uh, follow up. And they still, it's still uh, high frequency is better in these patients. And spinal cord stimulation with additional peripheral nerve field stimulation might be uh, used. And uh, with these in this study, they say this is an interesting patient of mine. 43, nine year old uh, female. And there is a very bizarre, uh, you see there are 12 levels of uh, instrumentation and there was a, a really hard uh, fibrosis. So we opened this fibrosis with uh, the uh, catheter that we use in epidroscopy, a radio frequency catheter, open the space for the electrode and put the electrode uh, through that. Uh, space. It, is, uh, it was the uh, rough, uh, toughest case I ever had in uh, spinal cord stimulation. So in summary, indications of lumbar surgery must be considered carefully be before the operation as there is a high risk of post-laminectomy syndrome. More screws means more pain and the cause of post-laminectomy syndrome is complex where the management must be tailored according to the possible etiology. 
There are plenty of uh, treatment options. However, when there's plenty of options, there is uncertainty. And avoiding surgery when possible seems to be the best uh, option. So thank you very much. Uh, greetings from Turkey. And I hope we meet face to face uh, again in Indonesia or I would in Turkey too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Altan Sain. Alhamdulillah, I mean, we still have some time uh, for the discussion. Uh, let me raise the question for uh, Dr. Imani. Uh, Dr. Imani, uh, there's a question here uh, regarding the back pain associated with the old fracture. Um, as we know, that is very common uh, right now. Is there any algorithm or how to treat uh, or how to diagnose uh, those kind of uh, old fractured uh, vertebrae? Yeah, probably you have some uh, explanation for this. Thank you very much. Uh, usually the, for several fractures, it uh, for the best uh, result during six months after the fracture. And if, if the more than six months, the, there's not a good candidate. But if the patient has, if the patient remains her or his uh, back pain without radiculopathy, uh, we can take an MRI. And if there is remains the edema, it's maybe the augmentation may be useful. But uh, if the uh, vertebral fracture is cold or is remains more than one year, or if there is no pain, this is not con con good candidate for this procedure. So related to your uh, uh, explanation is that uh, if the patient has already had a fracture more than six months, it's not a good candidate for uh, augmentation, right? I'm just trying to emphasize yes. that. And um, yes, let me bring up the, another question for you, Dr. Imani. Uh, after chiloplasty, you immediately adjust for pain medication. Um, so probably is uh, the question. Uh, the questioner is wondering how to treat the patient. Should should we taper it off, or should we just um, uh, aggr uh, aggressively just stop the pain medication afterwards? Please, doctor. Uh, to provide the best result after the augmentation, this is very important that the first after the inclusion exclusion good candy, candy, uh, exclusion criteria. And after that, we uh, take a CT scan up to two hours after the procedure to watch or to, uh, if there is any spinal leakage in the canal or not. And after that, uh, we can uh, some mild medication for example, in state or asaminophen, and we can uh, ambulate the patient about six or 12 hours after the procedure. Therefore, uh, we don't disconnection or discontinuation of the medication, but this is not need to high energy. Usually a mild, mild energy is enough for this patient. So probably acetaminophen or some NSAIDs yes. should be sufficient, right? Yes. Okay, um, so uh, is there any red flags that we should know about this uh, augmentation, doctor? So um, meaning to say that it's a big no-no for this uh, patient. Yes. The most uh, red flag are is the pain to suffer from radiculopathy if there is the posterior wall of the vertebral body is not intact or is fracture in the bed in the burst fracture or in the cord compression, or these are not candidated for the augmentation. Only the fracture, including compression fracture, usually about one half of the height is reduced, no cord compression, no radiculopathy, no infection, no burst fracture. These are good candidates for scheduled augmentation. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. Now let's relate um, your uh, explanation, Dr. Imani, with um, Dr. Uh, Professor Altan. Uh, there's a question here. Um, 
Will there be any chance that um, post-laminectomy syndrome will happen after chyloplasty? So um, I don't know about this, but uh, is there any um, uh, relation between those post-laminectomy and uh, chyloplasty uh, procedure? Please, Dr. Uh, Professor Alten. Well, I'm not aware of uh, such a thing. Of course, there are some complications and uh, post-laminectomy syndrome uh, is, uh, happens after surgery and there might be uh, some complications are included in the etiology of this. So uh, there are some complications of uh, kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty as uh, Professor Arm uh, Imani uh, uh, said. And uh, the, the leakage is very important, but what can be done is uh, really uh, challenging in these kind of uh, issues. And uh, so uh, actually it is not a uh, post-laminectomy syndrome or failed back surgery syndrome. This is not a surgery, this is an inter th that is an intervention. So, uh, but every intervention has its own uh, complications and own uh, favors. Yes, okay, thank you for that. Um, there's a question here regarding uh, the usage of pregabalin uh, before the treatment of uh, post-laminectomy syndrome. Is there any advantages if we give pregabalin beforehand? Well, as I told you, uh, as I told in my lecture, uh, the conservative treatments should be done properly. So uh, one of the uh, drugs used in conservative uh, treatment is pregabalin. When, if the patient has a neuropathic pain, uh, so uh, we can check it with DN4 or uh, Lens uh, scale. And if the patient has neuropathic pain, of course, pregabalin is the first line treatment of uh, neuropathic pain. Uh, however, uh, if it doesn't work or it, it uh, cannot relieve pain uh, enough, so uh, we can we go to the interventions. Okay, doctor. Um, for both of you, um, there's this question is that um, how, sh how long should we wait for the conservative therapy or for, uh, for example, physiotherapy or any other therapy before we do any intervention? Please probably uh, Dr. Imani can start. Uh, usually uh, two or three months we uh, the conservative treatment for the patient. And if there is a bit full of uh, physiotherapy, medication, bed rest, and uh, ergonomy of the patient is not a good response to medication and physiotherapy, usually conservative during two or, uh, two or three months. And if this is not appropriate response, after that, they're scheduled for um, appropriate intervention. Okay, so if the patient uh already underwent uh, physiotherapy for two or three months or any other medication, and probably this is the best time for uh, chyloplasty, right, Doctor? Okay, so uh, what about uh, you, uh, Professor Sahin? Um, should well, we wait or should we just go directly to intervention? Well, what I think is, uh, well, give it a try to uh, the uh, conservative methods, but if they don't work after uh, I don't. I don't wait three, four months if the patient still uh, experiencing pain, suffering pain. So there's no need to suffer pain. So if there are some uh, effective uh, treatments, we should uh, immediately do it. I uh, do wait some for, for, for example, couple of weeks, couple of or, or a month. But uh, if there is no pain relief after uh, these. And especially if the patient, if uh, under medical therapy, uh, there are side effects of these drugs and which can be excruciating uh, to these patients, uh, we do, I do uh, interventions. Okay, doctor. Um, there's this uh, question. Uh, I think this is uh, for Dr. Sain. Um, there are this, um, kind of uh, anatomical distortion 
after they perform laminectomy, right? So probably uh, uh, the, the, the epidural uh, space is altered or any other uh, condition that can make the anatomy is much more different than the normal person. If they want, or if we want to inject steroids, will it um, disperse or will it, uh, will it reach the, the height that we want after the procedure of laminectomy? Of course, this is a uh, this is a problem. Very good question. Thank you very much. And uh, because there is epidural fibrosis, and this fibrotic tissue may attach to the uh, nerve root, sometimes you cannot uh, reach the uh, the uh, target. So, uh, especially in these patients, I prefer radio frequency and. Uh, the radio frequency must be done awake in awake patient with mild sedation and analgesia, and the nerves must be found. The sensorial nerves must be found. Uh, I know there are some other techniques with using uh, motor uh, sensation and uh, finding a multifidus uh, twitch and then burn there. This is this is not the case in these patients. You must find the sensorial nerve, even if you're uh, pr uh, performing uh, the set radio frequency or DRG radio frequency, you must find the nerve. And uh, this uh, is a problem uh, in these uh, kind of patients. Uh, and uh, in order to open this uh, fibrosis, uh, hyaluronic acid and um, Mechanical adhesiolysis is important uh, treatment options. Okay, thank you very much for all the answers. Um, to all the speakers, let me wrap up. Let me wrap up everything that we've uh, talked about this afternoon. So, um, uh, for all the doctors here, we need to consider uh, for pain management, especially related to the vertebrae. Uh, there are some uh, previous, uh, before we do interventional, sometimes we need to pull the brake and uh, reevaluate the patient. Uh, just take your time. Probably physiotherapy or any, med any medication that can relieve the patient, it will help. But after some time, you need to decide whether we need to do interventional pain management or not. Um, for a vertebral body uh, fractured, there are lots of uh, uh, technique right now that uh, was uh, mentioned uh, a while ago by Professor Imani. Um, we need, uh, there are lots of choices about that. And for post-laminectomy pain, I like what you said, Professor, uh, less screw, less pain. I will, yes. I will remember that for the rest of my life, I think. Okay, thank you very much for all the speakers. Uh, let me close this uh, session by a prayer. Uh, Subhanallahumma wa bihamdika. Let's pray for the peace of the world. Thank you very much, doctors. Thank you very much.